So today I'm going to be talking about the future of epidemics in the 21st century and how something called the One Health approach could be the solution to the rising threat of novel pathogens. So before I get started, I'm going to tell you a bit about myself. My name is Leia and I'm a rising senior in Toronto, Canada. I'm someone who's really interested in the intersection of science and society. I have a background in Model UN, but also in biochemistry research. Um, and combining those two fields is what really got me interested in global health to begin with. So that's sort of the framework that I'm going to be using to talk about global health in this presentation. Essentially, the interplay between human activities and the natural world, and how the health of human communities is inextricably linked to that of our natural environment. So when COVID-19 first hit North America earlier this year, the sudden changes in our day-to-day -day lives took many of us completely by surprise. But for many epidemiologists, a crisis of this scale came as no shock at all. For decades now, the world has been inching closer and closer to a pandemic breaking point, and it's pretty much only by sheer chance that it didn't happen sooner. Just a cursory look back at the last 20 years can tell you that something is wrong. Since the year 2000, the world has already been rocked by six major international epidemics, namely SARS, H1N1, MERS, Zika, Ebola, and now COVID-19. On top of that, the total number of disease outbreaks across the world has been rising steeply and steadily. Between 1980 and 2005, the global number of annual outbreaks increased by nearly sixfold. So what's driving this deadly trend? Well, there are typically two categories of pandemic risk factors that epidemiologists examine. There are spark risks, which cause a pathogen to appear in the community, and there are spread risks, which cause that pathogen to spread within a community. Many features of modern life have exacerbated spread risks across the world, including urbanization, population growth, and globalization. These have all made it easier than ever for diseases to transmit from human to human. But what about spark risks? Well, it turns out that over the last few decades, the number of emerging infectious diseases, or EIDs, has also been drastically increasing. These are novel pathogens that have never been observed in humans before, so they can be extremely difficult to contain. And we've seen this firsthand with COVID-19 for the past few months. The majority of EIDs are zoonotic, meaning that they are transmitted from animals to humans. One way to understand the process of zoonotic transmission uses five stages, with the pathogen's epidemic potential increasing at each stage. In this model, most pathogens exist in stage one. They're, not, they're only infectious in the animals they are native to, and they're harmless to humans. However, every once in a while, a stage one pathogen will mutate by chance and gain the ability to transmit into humans. The pathogen now enters stage two. At this point, the pathogen can be transmitted from animal to human, but not from human to human. So the epidemic potential is still low. One well-known example of a stage two pathogen is rabies. A human bitten by a rabid dog will become sick, but that human will not be able to infect others around them. It's important to note that not just any animal species will transmit pathogens to humans. The probability of transmission depends on species to species contact as well as phylogenetic proximity. Take chimpanzees, for instance. Despite very infrequent encounters with humans, they have been the origin of many human diseases because of their close phylogenetic relationship to humans. Then, then in stages three and four, the pathogen mutates further and develops the ability to spread from human to human in multiple rounds of infection. This is where epidemic potential begins to rise. Once human-to-human -human transmission is possible, all it takes is one species spillover event to create an outbreak. Ebola, yellow fever, dengue fever, and cholera are all well-known examples of stage three and four pathogens. And then finally, in stage five, the pathogen is exclusively transmitted human-to-human. -human. In terms of epidemic potential, this is the peak. Without the need for an animal reservoir, which would typically confine a pathogen to the animal's native geographic location, a stage five pathogen can freely travel as far as it likes, as long as there are humans around to infect. Perhaps the most notorious example of a stage five disease is HIV, which first originated in chimpanzees, but now has destroyed millions of human lives across the world. So what was the point of explaining all that? Well, in recent years, human activities have shifted many zoonotic pathogens up the stages, drastically increasing their epidemic potentials. As humans have destroyed natural habitats and increased demand for animal meat, um, animal-human contact has become far more frequent in many parts of the world. With greater contact comes a greater probability of interspecies spillover events and the emergence of new stage two pathogens. 
On top of that, more contact also means that animal pathogens have more exposure to human physiologies and can therefore adapt to human-human transmission much faster. This allows them to reach higher stages with greater epidemic potentials much sooner. To understand the rise in zoonotic EIDs a bit better, let's look at some case studies. The first one I'm going to talk about is the 2014 Ebola outbreak in West Africa, which started in a remote Ghanaian village called Meliandu. For some background information, throughout the 1990s, West Africa was ravaged by civil wars, which displaced hundreds of thousands of people from their homes. As these refugees fled from the conflict, they built new homes in rural areas deep in the forest. Because of this, the region's huge forest cover was reduced to a fraction of its original size, and its wildlife was forced to move closer to human settlements. The village of Meliandu, seen here, was surrounded by forest, but the broader region was heavily deforested. Thus, wildlife was cornered into living in the small strip of forest right next to the village. Even worse, many of the villagers were accustomed to eating only what they hunted from the forest. This was a recipe for a zoonotic disaster. The constant animal-human contact in Meliandu made the chance of a spillover event nearly inevitable. And that's just what happened in late 2013, when fruit bats in the forest exposed a two-year-old boy from the village to fluids carrying the Ebola virus. From there, reinforced by the vulnerabilities of poverty and civil unrest, a cascade of Ebola infections led to the worst outbreak of the disease in history, killing over 10,000 people. Our second case study is Marburg hemorrhagic fever, which is a virus closely related to Ebola. It's had numerous outbreaks linked to mining activities in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Again, for some background information, the DRC is known for its wealth of mined resources, including gold and coltan. These metals are both highly sought after by electronics manufacturers like Apple, as they play critical roles in the inner circuitry of cell phones. Coltan especially is quite rare, and there have actually been a number of armed conflicts in the DRC relating to coltan mines because the metal is so prized. Now, because there is so much demand, many small independent mining operations have appeared throughout the DRC. If miners can't find work in one of the big industrial mines, they simply take it upon themselves to make their own. These operations are called subsistence mines, and they often just consist of men digging their way through remote natural areas in the hopes of finding anything. Much like with the previous case study, the danger here lies in the proximity of these mines to wildlife. They're often right next to or even inside forests with no perimeters, and the miners rely on bushmeat or hunted wildlife for subsistence. In 1998, an outbreak of Marburg that started in a DRC gold mine killed 154 people. And in 2004, another outbreak in the DRC killed 227 people. So what can we do with this information? While most current pandemic preparedness measures focus on reducing spread risk to limit morbidity and mortality after a pathogen has already entered a community. But what if we could stop outbreaks before they even happen? To do this, you would have to target the spark risk. As we, and as we've just seen, zoonotic EIDs are some of the biggest spark risks around. This is the concept behind One Health, an approach to epidemiology that considers human health, animal health, and the environment to be fundamentally connected. One Health works by monitoring animal pathogens with pandemic potential and investigating risk factors like urbanization, domestication, and habitat destruction. This idea has been around for a long time, but just recently it has started to gain traction in countries where traditional pandemic prevention measures have continuously fallen short. In Chad, a One Health approach successfully responded to endemic Q fever through joint animal and human vaccination interventions. In Ethiopia, a One Health approach was instrumental in the control of bovine tuberculosis that was rampant among Somali shepherds. But if we really want to make sure that a pandemic like COVID-19 doesn't happen again, we need to think bigger. Like with all the big challenges facing humanity right now, climate change, inequality, poverty, the root cause lies in our own actions. Ebola virus may have come from a fruit bat, but the Ebola epidemic was caused by a war that led to the destruction of Guinea's forests, decimating natural habitats for its wildlife. Marburg fever may have originated in the Congo's rainforest wildlife, but the outbreaks were caused by our insatiable need for new electronics, which has replaced animal habitats with gold and coltan mines. At the core of all this is a lesson in consequences. As humans, especially in the first world, we like to think of ourselves as separate from the natural world. When we look at an iPhone, we see a trendy product with a hefty price tag, nothing more. 
What we don't like to see is where that iPhone came from, the factories and mines in the third world, where every day people lose their lives to brutal work conditions, violent conflict, and zoonotic EIDs. Let us take COVID-19 as a warning to think deeper about the effects of our actions and how they ripple through the environment and come back to bite us. Because if we don't, who knows how deadly the next pandemic will be. So these are just some references I used for the presentation. And if you'd like to contact me for any further questions, that's my email and that's my Instagram. Thank you.